Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Believe in Bears. My name is Joey Christopoulos with my co-host, Corey Wooten. But first, today's episode is presented by BetOnline.ag, and it's football season. It's back and better than ever. And BetOnline is back and better than ever with a new web interface for the start of the basketball season as well. And it's got more props, odds, and lines than ever before. And that's because BetOnline remains the number one spot for the basketball and football action this season. So head to the new updated desktop or go on your mobile right now to sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. When you use promo code BELIEVE50, B-L-E-A-V-5-0 to receive that bonus. Basketball, football, baseball postseason, it's almost over. NHL, boxing, right down to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Because at Bet Online, it's the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming into the pod. It got close, but it's no cigar as the Chicago Bears drop their third game in a row, 33 to 22 to San Francisco 49ers in week eight. Let's bring in my co-host, former Bears defensive end and Fox 32 Chicago's Corey Wooten himself. Corey, man, I'm going to leave the floor open to you, man. How are you? So great to see you. Happy Halloween. And what did you think of that defense? Oh man, it was it was very disheartening, right? If you thought in the game, you thought it would come down to offensively if we could score when we needed to in, in different nice. points, and I thought they did a pretty good job of it for the most part. You know, you know, making consistent drives. You know, not having three and outs. You know, mixing and matching the run in the pass, but defensively, you know, I thought in the first half they did a pretty good job, um, and then in the second half it just fell apart. You know, when we needed to make stops, when we needed to make stands, uh, when we need to get off the field, we couldn't. And it's a situation where, you know, in my opinion, you know, I think this is a game that you you gave Jimmy Garoppolo a lot of confidence. I mean, I don't think he's that talented as a quarterback, to be honest. Nothing, nothing against him or whatever. But I think in the scheme of things, this gave him the confidence going forward for the rest of the season when this game, this should have been a game where you really got after him, you know, and, and – I thought there was going to be a lot more pressure, right? Because early on, you know, we saw them dial up a, a little bit of the blitz and I was excited about it. You know, the only thing I wasn't excited about at times where you dialed up the blitz, there wasn't some press coverage. And I think those go hand in hand together. Um, you know, I saw some of those situations where they brought Roquan, they brought a safety in there and the defenders are so far off. And I'm like, you, you realize, right? This all works together, right? When we're bringing pressure, the ball's going to come out quick. So you can be a little more physical at the line of scrimmage on a receiver. And we just didn't see enough of that. And, uh, you know, I think the, the defining play of the game was the Debo Samuel play. That swing screen, right? A swing screen on third and 20, Joey. Um, Corey, you know, go into it, man. How much does that hurt you as a former player, man? That's just one of those probability like what four percent of the time that that goes for 85 yards just talk it talk about that yeah i think 99 percent of the time third and 20 a swing screen you know they maybe get 15 16 yards 17 yards at the most yeah. on, on a bad on a bad pursuit bad tackling uh, but you get off the field in that situation and on third and 20 all the odds are in your favor um you have to get off the field i mean there's there's no excuse for that um lack of hustle lack of tackling um yeah, it was just a basic, a basic play. They they knew they weren't even going to get it. I, I feel like they. It's one of those plays where like, hey, let's just let's just get off the field. Let's let's move to the next situation. Let's get five seven yards and then punt it and then let's play defense. I think that's what they were going towards. I didn't think they thought it was going to be an you know eighty five yard play or ninety yard play, whatever it was. But that is so disheartening. Like because all the momentum was in the Bears' favor at that point in time, and that game that play shifted the whole momentum of the game to San Francisco. And then you see Jimmy Garoppolo get some confidence because before that he was, eh, you know, he, he was in there completing a couple throws here or there, but nothing wooed or wowed you. Um, so that's a situation where as a defense, you, you have to pride yourself on getting off on third and 20, right? It's not like it was third and four, third and five, third and 20, like 99% of the time a defense is going to get off the field. So you, you have to in that situation. For the Chicago Bears defense, this is the fourth time in since 1940 that they have zero sacks, zero takeaways, and give up over 400 yards of total offense, uh, total offense to the opponent. Not good. And Corey, man, that moment was just so. I mean, and dude, I think you've been talking about it for a little while. Of on third and twenty, right? It's clear the 49ers don't trust Jimmy Garoppolo 
because they throw a wide receiver screen to Debo Samuel, right? They're like, we're not going to put this, we're not going to put any more than 12 yards, air yards on this one because he couldn't make a mistake. And the Bears still couldn't come down with it. And again, something that we've said previously in these different pods, the Bears get a score. The Bears defense for all of its highlights this season, the Bears defense gives it right back every single drive. It just keeps happening over and over again. Does that do just emotionally? What does that do for an offense trying to make progress and trying to, you know, get its feet under them? And what does that do for a defense that's supposed to be, I think, maybe the anchor of this team while we work with a working quarterback on the other side? Yeah, I, I think it's disheartening on all levels because I think this was a must win game. If you're talking about looking at the overall schedule, right? This was a very winnable game against a struggling team, just like you. You're kind of at a point where you're trying to figure out what's going on offensively. They didn't feel good about that. And, you know, defensively, you thought you were at a point where, hey, you know, maybe we haven't been playing as well as we normally did in the prior seasons, but we're good enough to win games in this situation. And even with Khalil Mack being out, I really thought that they were still going to be able to get that pressure really fluster Jimmy Garoppolo, really take him out of his element, you know, especially, you know, they're making a big deal about, oh, he's playing at home and blah, 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 from Arlington Heights, you know, I don't really care in the scheme of things, yeah. but, you know, you, you 20, had, you in, had 2030, in 2030, when the Bears moved to Arlington Heights, we can yeah. say that. Until then, no, just check Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But this is a situation where, you know, he's playing at, at his home stadium, quote unquote, and you could you could you could have really gave it to him in this game. I mean, dialed him up because he was already struggling. Like you look at the past few games. I mean, you know, they've been deciding between him and Trey Lance going back and forth. And you had a chance to really, really put the nail in the coffin, you know, on, on this Niners team and Jimmy Garoppolo. And you weren't able to do it. Um, so that's disheartening. And the fact that. You know, usually it's the it's the defense. Like, okay, we're making stops. We need the offense to do something. And I feel like it was the opposite in this situation. In this game, I feel like this was probably the second best offensive performance, in my opinion, besides that Lions game. You know, where they were really making progress. And when Justin Fields needed to make a play, he did. You know, in that situation on that on that fourth and one where he scrambled and it looked like a Madden Michael Vick type of play. That's that's what Justin Fields can do which is unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's such a different dynamic because he was dead to rights four or five times. And he was like, Nope, he turned on the burners. And, and that's what you have in Chicago. So for anybody saying, Oh, Justin Fields is maybe not as good. Listen, I'm telling you, this guy is going to be the next dude, that dude, I'm telling you, like, you know, regardless of when you see him throw the stripes to Jesse James in the end zone across his body, Dropping an absolute dime where only he can get it. That that was one of the that was Aaron Rodgers esque. Unbelievable. It reminded me exactly of Aaron Rodgers when he's rolling across his body, throwing a dart right on the money. You know how hard that is to do. And the location of it too was what also impressed me. That was very Aaron Rodgers esque. The the low, the low and away, the only place exactly. that Jesse James. Where only he can get it, or it's an incomplete pass, right? And Jesse James makes a great catch. And don't sleep on him. I mean, honestly, like when we talk about the tight ends, right? Like, I like Cole Komet, but Jesse James and, and a guy like Jasper Horsted in, in the red zone situations, I feel really confident about them. Not only their ability to get open, but their ability to catch the ball. So, you know, this week I, I look for them to really target those guys and especially Jesse James in the red zone against his former team, you know, the Steelers and that. But I mean, yeah, offensively, I, I love what I saw from Justin Fields. And the key thing, right, Joey, what we've been talking about is one, two, the progression, tuck it and go. And that's what we saw. There was one time where we held it a little bit too long and he got sacked. Um, maybe, maybe there's one other time. I remember one for sure uh, that he held it a little bit too long, but you saw that clock get it out. And he had over 100 yards rushing. Like, remember I told you how hard that is for defenses, defensive linemen, linebackers to account for a guy like that. And when he's decisive in that, tuck it and go, you know, once once he has that progression. And that's probably what they told him this week. He probably watched it in film and they said, listen, okay, I love what you're trying to do. You're trying to throw the ball down the field and get it. But listen, you have to go one, two. It's not there. Tuck it and go. And that's what he did this week. And it was fun to see because it kept the defense off balance. And they weren't able, you know, they had they had four sacks in the game, you know, this, that, and the other. But I, I thought it was a much better game from him being decisive on his reads and using his feet when he could. Well, they started doing stuff that you've been talking about for a couple of weeks now, right? I saw naked boots. 
I saw RPO keepers. He finally found that right moment when they bit in on it and he was able to go. He faked the camera out, which is one of my yeah, favorites. And, right and, that and that's, the, that's the best part, right? Because because you know what that does, Joey? That was one play in particular, right? And the thing is, next game, they don't even have to run that same play, but they can give the illusion of it. Yes. And then what is everybody going to do? Stay at home and then it's going to open up the run game on the other side. So that's the Justin Fields effect. And I thought this was one of the best called offensive games since that Lions game, you know, and in my opinion, I thought this was could, could be potentially better because there were some design QB runs and not even just the RPO, just drop back and go, mm -hmm. you know, acting like you're going to pass and then go um, for sure. Because there was a couple that I was like, oh, that was definitely a design run, you know, but they gave you the illusion like he was like it was a straight drop back. So I, I loved what I saw from that, disguising that and keeping them off balance. And I think it's a situation if the defense could have played better. Remember, I was talking about, you know, the 20, 28 to 21 score that I was talking about. I yeah. feel like they could have got that, if not more, if the defense was able to hold up better. You know, I honestly think this game came down to that Debo Samuel touchdown or almost touchdown, that long play on the third and 20. Well, that was that was the game changer right there. Well, and on top of it, too, uh, we're rocking and rolling in the first half. We score on the first three possessions of the game, and then we give up a deep ball to Debo Samuel with 25 seconds left, which let him get a field goal towards the, you know, the end of the thing. And that's sort of something that, you know, offensively, I completely agree with you. They're 8 or 13 on third down. The time of possession, I think, was 37 minutes to 22 minutes. That's exactly what we wanted to do. And it's exactly, more importantly, what we wanted to see from Justin Fields. This is the kind of progress that not only gets you excited on Twitter, because you can watch the 22-yard run, but I think the stuff that we're starting to see that you've been harping for for weeks now is starting to come to fruition, and we're getting some confidence with it. The only problem is we can go to the Browns game and the Buccaneers game, and they get blown out, and you can say the Bears suck. You can go to the Lions and the Raiders game and say, you know, when the Bears play their game, they can be pretty good. The The part that scared me the most, Corey, and I want to get your perspective on it, is we did stuff in this game that just bad teams do, man. And and that's, what's, that's what scared me probably the most. We're talking about Justin Fields and moving the ball, holding penalties at just, the, just exactly the wrong time, right? We're rocking, we're rolling, all of a sudden it's second and 21. We were able to overcome that in a couple situations thanks to some great plays by Justin Fields. But again, some of those field goals probably could have been touchdowns without those penalties. Again, at the end of the half, you give up a huge bomb to Debo Samuel, which sets up you know a field goal. And then that Debo Samuel 85-yarder in the second half. This is just stuff that bad teams do, unfortunately. And it's something that the Bears just kind of keep, you know, I, again, Justin Fields scores. Cairo Santos, been amazing all year, misses the extra point. It's stuff that bad teams do, and I think that really kind of came to the surface in this game a little bit. And, I mean, I, tell me, Corey, can can they clean that stuff up? I mean, because it is starting to become a bit of a trend, a bit of a theme. Yeah, they, they can clean it up. Um, you know, some of those plays, you know, when you have a holding, sometimes you get your hands a little outside. Uh, things happen. Um, I think it comes down to like this. I, I don't think a holding play is going to make or break a game. Mm. I think it's the thing being disciplined on like a third down or Cairo Santos missing an, an easy extra point. Those are the things that kill you as a team because yeah. that was a situation where that could have been the game, that field goal or the extra point rather. You know, that could have been a point where you're like, oh, we lost the game because of that. You know, and hey, they tie you know, it up. Forty Nine ers get a field goal. Yeah, we can't. Exactly. We have a touchdown now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and those are the little things. And everyone says, well, you know, that used to be the thing when when you talk about a kicker, you're like, listen, this dude's got one job. And I understand if he misses a fifty something yard or sixty something yarder, but inside thirty five yards, forty yards, he's got to be automatic. I mean, that's that's what they pay you for. You know what I'm saying? And if you cannot make it a chippy, that's what we used to call it back in basketball, the easy layup. That's the equivalent to it, a chippy. If you cannot make that, you're going to hurt your team. And the same thing with that third and 20. That is a 99.9% .9 of the time you get off the field. Mm -hmm. You cannot win games in that situation because that was the momentum killer in that game. That's when the Bears were rocking. All the momentum's in their favor. We got them in third and 20. Crowd's rocking. <sighs> you know, and then all of a sudden deflated. Oh. <gasps> You know, we thought at first was the touchdown. Then we got him in there. And then we had a situation to bow up and potentially yeah. stop him. Because I know, I knew at the end of the day, regardless if Jimmy Garoppolo got in on that, they were, they were four down territory. They were going for a touchdown no matter what. I know Kyle Shanahan and how aggressive he is at times. So I thought this is a situation where, hey, 
you know, they run the ball here, then you got a third down, then they're going to feel like they're going to pass it. Then you get them on a fourth down in a situation where they got to pass it again. And you can potentially have, you know, have a stop, regardless of how bad everything was. That situation where, hey, Jimmy Garoppolo getting in touch, that, that shouldn't happen. It's not like he's a Cam Newton, you know, can run you over. Nah. You, and he went to the left, too. Come on. Exactly. Mike. When he's in a situation, you got to you gotta tattoo that dude, you know, because you can't hit a quarterback nowadays. So in that situation, everybody should have been on all cylinders to the ball trying to knock his block off. I mean, that's as simple as that. That I thought in that situation, I was like, oh, the Bears are going to go off right here, you know, because they're going – this is four-down territory for them. They're not going for a field goal, you know. So that's a situation where – Ah, you know, even after the third and 20, you got to bow up. You know, you got to bow up in that situation for a team in the Niners that have struggled in the red zone. You know, you you just thought like, hey, let's let's take this momentum back. And unfortunately, they they weren't. And, you know, the Niners were able to capitalize on it. But that's the situation. That's a game. This is a game that we should have won. I mean, everything was was going in our favor. Justin Fields was comfortable. The offense was rocking. And, you know, up until Khalil Herbert got banged up, I mean, everything was rolling on all cylinders. And I think that was kind of the X factor where we saw the offense kind of shift a little bit where he got, I don't know if he, he got the wind knocked out of him or he bruised his ribs or stood him. They, so they thought like he took a knee to the head, but I'm with you. I thought he just landed when, when the ball yeah. came out, he landed on the football and it just went in yeah. there. And I can imagine that probably yeah. knocks the wind out of you and probably hurts. Yeah. You're right. When he came back, it was the first time we saw a couple TFLs with Herbert with the ball in his hands in the backfield. Yeah. And he just and, and didn't have that same edge. He, he, he just looked like he did, wasn't decisive. Like he, he almost wasn't trying to get hit. And I was like, whoa, this is the guy that's going forward every time. It seemed totally. like something was bothering him. I don't know if he bruised his sternum or – because when you get the wind knocked out of you, usually pretty quickly you're, you're good. Like I was uh, at the broadcasting thing I did on Sunday – uh, my co-host asked me, he said, have you ever got the wind knocked out of you? I said, yeah, we played Rashad Jennings, the running back, um, and I didn't see him, and he completely chipped me and got the wind knocked out of me. And it was like it was like a good, like, you know, couple minutes, and then you feel normal. So I don't know if there's more to it, like maybe he bruised his sternum or his ribs or something. But, um, yeah, it just, it just seemed like he didn't have that same decisiveness that we saw because there was a time where he got tackled – uh, for a loss and it looked like he had a clear cutback lane where he could have got mm-hmm. five, six, seven, eight yards. So it just kind of seemed once he got that injury, he fell on the bottom of what happened. Maybe it was his head. Um, you know, uh, it just didn't seem like the same running back and the offense didn't seem like it was rolling on all cylinders. Um, but, you know, to further talk about the offense, I mean, how about, how about Darnell Mooney? I mean, I really love what I saw from him in his route running and, and he's, you know, Justin Fields' favorite target right now. By far. Yeah. By far. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I think you know, what I was talking to everyone, they said, oh, what about Allen Robinson? What about this? And I said, the thing with Allen Robinson is he doesn't get open the same way Darnell Mooney does. You know, and, and, and that's how Allen Robinson has always been, right? He's a guy that goes up and gets it, right? You're going to throw the ball up thinking he's going to get it every time. So maybe Justin Fields is like, I don't know if I feel comfortable. I don't know if I feel on the same page with him at this point, right? So if I throw it up and it's not there, because there's been a couple of interceptions where you've been like, oh, yeah, I thought he was doing this. I thought he thought wrong, right? So and he knows, hey, Darnell Mooney, he's a great route runner. He's able to get open and he's able to do, you know, things that Allen Robinson can't. So that's that's why it seems like they're creating a great rapport out there, which is great to see because the two young guys and Mooney, in my opinion, is a rising star. You know, I think uh, when when it's time for contract time, I think he's going to get paid really big. And I think he can be one of the elite receivers in this league. Um, you know, I think he has everything. He has the speed, he has the route running ability, he has the hands. Um, you know, he's a humble guy. He's not one of those guys that's all into himself. Um, I think he's a team player. Um, and I think it's good to, to build around something like him. In my opinion, I, I have the vibe that Allen Robinson might, might not be there next year. You know, just, just how everything's going Will right now. Will he be here by this Thursday? <laughs> yeah but i mean in your opinion don't you just think this just how everything is playing out it just seems like okay you're, you're looking at who's more valuable to the team right now a guy that's on his rookie contract or a guy that wants to get paid like he's one of the elite receivers you know what i mean yeah I, in my in my opinion too if you're Allen robinson and let's look at it from a business perspective he's playing for 17 million right now he came into the year wanting to be a 20 million dollar receiver Let's be honest, he's not going to get that $20 million. So unfortunately, probably what's going to happen to Allen Robinson is 
he's going to have to go out in the open market and he, despite fit and maybe despite the place that he wants to go to, he's probably going to have to take the money. You know, maybe there's a Jaguars reunion, but probably do what Kenny Galladay did, right? Where Kenny Galladay just goes, where's my top dollar? And I'll probably just take it. And I don't know if that's going to necessarily be with the Chicago Bears because towards the end, I want to ask you about a couple of big picture things that the Bears are going to have to think of. My question for you, though, and I heard a little bit about this, and I want to get your perspective on it, is is there also the possibility that maybe Bears fans don't understand and see that with a young quarterback like Justin Fields, is there a re- is there a possibility that maybe they're just not scheming into the game plan Allen Robinson as the one-two on a lot of these looks and maybe trying to use him as a veteran, not a decoy, but trying to use that savvy in a different way? I've kind of heard that a little bit where, like, you know, look, like, sometimes you'll know how many targets you're going to get in a game, um, you know, when you walk into that matchup. Is that a little bit of something that might be going on with Allen Robinson too? or Because I'm in agreement with uh, you, but I don't think Ju- Justin Fields just trusts the tight window that he has to work with yeah. with Allen Robinson. I, I, I think that's that's the whole thing. I think right now, right, when you talk about getting a young quarterback comfortable, it's about who who gets the most open at this point, right? So then then you feel confident in your throws, right? And I think, I think you know, a guy like Jesse James, he feels good with the tight end position, Cole Komet, because that's the thing where, where it's a zone beater. It's a zone reader. That's where you can look at it, and he's open. There's a window right there. You fit it. A guy like Darnell Mooney that gets great separation, right? Mm-hmm. And he feels comfortable with that. I think Allen Robinson, the window is tighter. So he may, he may be talking to Bill Lazor and say, listen, I know A-Rob is a dog. But right now I feel most comfortable because I know they're talking back and forth because he wants, he wants, Justin Fields is a young guy, but you have to, you have to have that communication with your coordinator and say, Hey, I feel more confident, you know, going with the tight ends. Cause that's what they've done the past couple of weeks. We've seen the, the tight end package open up. We've seen Jesse James. We've seen Cole Komet the past few games have four five, six, seven targets in a game. You know, before that he, he didn't have many. So we're seeing kind of the pattern where it's going. It's going to the Y position. It's going to a guy like Darnell Mooney. You know, at times, you know, Goodwin has been has been great with his route running and separation, um, which is which is great for him because his whole knock, his whole career has been, oh, he's only a, 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 deep, a deep go guy. You know, he can't run routes. He can't catch the ball. But what, what we've seen from him, every time he's been targeted, I mean, he's been making some great catches. His route running looks good. We always knew about his speed. But it seems like he's kind of had a resurgence of his career from what everybody thought he could be. Um, but yeah, I, I was just impressed um, with the plan they had, especially going against Bosa early on. You know, offensively, I thought they, they were having two tight ends on them, you know, Chipper helping out, and then that one play uh, where they had, I think it was was it Alex Bars, I believe, that was the extra tackle as a tight end. Was that him? Yeah, they. I think well. Yeah. He is either that or he holds one of the one of the two. Yeah, because they were brought. Okay, yeah, I, I thought it was I thought it was Alex Bars, but um, he was basically a tight end at you know an extra offensive lineman as a, as a tight end, and he had one on one on both. That's when he got the holding penalty, and Bosa got the sack, and that's a situation where I'm like, hey, listen, in that situation, right? You know when Joey Bosa is head up on this guy, and and how he's light on the stance, he knew right away he was pass blocking. So you, what did he do? He hit him with the outside move, came back inside. It's, it's like taking candy from a baby, yeah. you know, in situations like that, you know, playing defensive end when I knew I had, you know, a slower uh, offensive guy, you know, I, I knew I could hit him with a move and then come back inside real quick because you know what they're trying to do is keep you one on one on here, get that boot out there. So Joey Bosa knew it, you know, from film study, he knew it by the guy's stance. That situation where you got to keep two guys on them in, in that situation, maybe hold the tackle back to help. That way, if he beats inside, he gives him a chip in the inside, and then he's able to help back on the defensive tackle. So that's a situation where that was a kind of drive killer in that situation. And before that, they, they had tabs on, on Joey Bosa, and that's a guy that you have to keep your attention on because D Ford was not playing in that game. So that's a situation where you're like, hey, we got one guy that can really beat us. You know, Eric Armstead in the past, kind of that guy as well, but he hasn't really been as productive, especially with DeForest Buckner you know, leaving a few seasons ago. So we haven't seen that same production. So that's a situation where I'm like, you cannot leave Alex Bars one-on-one on Joey Bosa. That's like, that's like saying, Hey, you're going to leave, you know, Steph Curry on, on Shaq in his prime to guard him one-on-one. You don't, you just don't do that. You know, he's too quick for him. So that's, that's why I didn't understand that situation because that was a drive killer. And I thought other than that, they did a pretty good job on, on a really talented pass rusher like him. 
Yeah, and I thought uh, Larry Borum for practice center only a couple of times this week. I thought he did a pretty solid job. I mean, you just didn't hear his name called a lot, which is usually a good sign if you're a Chicago Bears offensive lineman. Um, let's dive a little bit more into Justin Fields. Let's go a little bit further because I think a lot of Bears fans are upset today. Obviously, the defense, you know, disheartening is the perfect way to probably categorize the way that they played, and especially when you're looking forward to the weeks forward of where are we going to get some of these wins, how are we going to get back into the playoff mix as a Bears team. But yesterday, man, is going to be one of those days that we really needed to put on the Justin Fields calendar, right? When we finish the season and we look back and we're talking about progress and what is and what isn't, yesterday a 1,000% was one of those moments. You know, you mentioned 103 rushing yards, first time since Bobby Douglas in 1972, a quarterback for the Bears ran for that much. You've mentioned a little bit, but let's go you know, a little bit deeper and maybe bring up one of your favorite ones. What was it about Justin Fields' performance? I mean, I saw more decisiveness. I saw him better against the Blitz. I saw him you know, keeping it on RPOs. I saw him doing those naked boots that you love and just hitting quick passes. The arm was there. The playmaking was there. You know, what was it? It, it seemed like it was all kind of coming together for him a little bit. And this is a perfect yeah. game that hopefully he can build on moving on in the future. Yeah, I, I thought it came down to play calling. I thought Laser did a great job from play calling from, from the first series. And what we've seen in the progression of, of this Bears offense is the first 15, usually the first two drives, maybe into the third drive, is pretty good scripting. Yeah. You know, they usually score on the first drive and then into the second drive, they kind of they kind of have a sustaining drive where they get a couple first downs and maybe a punt. But what I saw was consistent game planning, right? And, um, you know, starting with the run, you know, Khalil Herbert was very effective early on. And then what does that do? That just helps with the confidence of a guy like Justin Fields because I feel like he becomes more comfortable because then you're able to do some of those boots, some of the hard play actions, um, things of that nature where he gets really comfortable. Then some design QB runs, you know, because I think they got to a point where, even Justin Fields as himself, I think he was like, I, I can be a passer. I'm a passer. Like, you know, I can run too, but I'm, they said, no, no, listen, listen. What separates you is your ability to run the football too. So they said, hey, if it's not there, go. And that's what I love what I saw from him. Because early on, what you saw was, you know, he had, a, he had that internal clock. You remember I said having that internal clock in your head. So much sharper which, this week. Exactly. What every great quarterback does, you know, and, and a guy like Kyler Murray, you know, a guy like Russell Wilson, you know, they have that same internal clock because they're mobile guys. They can throw as well. But what separates them is their ability to get it and go when they need to. Right. When the game's on the line, even a guy like Aaron Rodgers he doesn't have the speed that they do. But when he needs to run, he needs to get a first down. He does it. And that's what I saw from Justin Fields was his, his ability. Look at the first progression. Second progression is not there. I have the clock in my head. Let's go. And, and that's what you saw when he took it and go. I mean, just seeing like, you know, I was looking at the red zone of, of a guy like Josh Allen, who people think is a mobile guy compared to Justin Fields. No. It's night and day. He's got a different level of burst, a different level of juice that we used to call it. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun to see. And just seeing the progression, right, that that is such a huge thing, you know, Um you know, for, for Fox, we, we do a thing where we have underrated player. And he was my underrated player because, you know, when you look at look at on paper, you say, oh, well, you know, he was OK. And, you know, he had a couple of good plays here and there. But what I saw was progression. Right. And as a young guy, that's all you want to see is progression, because, listen, I don't expect him to be a pro bowler right now. Right. What I'm hoping for is a year, two years from now that he's one of the best in the league. He's like a Kyler Murray type mm -hmm. where everybody, all the attention's on him and he feels fully comfortable, right? And what you what you saw was comfortability. You know, you saw him being comfortable out there. And that's what I love to see from a young guy. The only thing I worry about is sometimes what, you, what you've seen, the trend is, right? He seems pretty comfortable at home, but on the road, you know, when the crowd noise is, is up and things of that nature, Things are a little different, right? When you have to rely on that and you, you got to rely on some talented pass rushers, you know, coming in like a guy like TJ Watt at home, they're, they're waving the terrible towels. Everything's going nuts. Uh, you know, they're bringing pressure from this way, that way. Cam Hayward's coming up the middle in your face. Can, can he be as confident? Can he be as comfortable, right? Can Bill Lazor scheme it up? Can we give extra chip help? You know, can we keep two tight ends at, at times? Can we let him be comfortable? Can we get some design runs, keep them off balance? I was going to say, and can, he, and can he trust early on enough in a game to say, 
I need to maybe lean on some athleticism like you're talking about to open up all the other stuff that I want to do. How do I take the pressure off myself as early as I can in the game? And, and that's that's what you do. That's what you saw the confidence come when he tucked when he tucked the ball and ran. And <laughs> you see San Francisco when you zoom in the sideline, the defensive coordinators are like, oh, my gosh, like, what are we doing? You know, it gets to a point where it, 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 your, your whole team is deflated. You're like, oh, my gosh, we have to keep the spy guy. Then, then there's not an extra defender out there for, for a potential wide receiver or tight end. You know, you have, you have to, okay, remember I told you about how we used to do it with Aaron Rodgers. Oh, okay, let's just, let's just go to the edge, set the edge as a pass run. Yeah. But, you know, everything you've been taught to pass rush, don't do that this week. And then you take guys out of their element, and that's the Justin Fields effect because what you're going to see is that's going to open everything up, right? And what what just what his feet are able to do, it just opens up a game plan. And in my opinion, I thought this performance is better than the Lions game. And people say, "Well, what are you talking?" Because because we what we saw was progress, right? When there was pressure in his face, when the reads weren't there, he used his feet, and that's what separates him from any other quarterback out there. And in my opinion, I, I think you know. A year or two from now, you know, people are going to look back and laugh about like, oh, we weren't sure if he was the guy because just seeing that progression this week, it it made me feel very good about the future of Justin Fields in Chicago. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward just to seeing the progress, but I want to see it on the road because that's a different element. You know, I think when you have the crowd noise and you have to go off a silent count and, you know, you're making checks and they can't hear you and then you have to go off this, you have to tap, you have to you know, do different, different signals. Is he able to get everything? Is he able to feel as confident? Is he able to get everything that you need to get done before no delay of games, things of that nature, you know, don't hold the ball too long. You know, when the, when the crowd is in there, because people sleep on, on how much that impacts young quarterbacks, especially guys that are, that are trying to get their feet under them. They're trying to get confidence. They're trying to build off games. So I'm hoping that they can have a good plan for that. And I think I think if they can have chippers, you know, a guy like Jesse James or Cole Komet, before they go out into their routes, chip T.J. Watt, chip that, that other uh, defensive end outside linebacker, just to buy them some extra time, Jason Peters and company. So, I completely agree with you, and you're making a great call about the road coming up, and there'll be another big test for Fields next week. But I, I think this was by far his best game, right? Two touchdowns, three field goals. You say to yourself, a rookie, maybe, you know, as he matures and progresses in this league, one of those field goals turns into a touchdown. That's 27 points, right? Yeah. And I just saw him, not only just the plays that he made with his legs and the decisions that he made, and God, when you saw him finally, you know, have that confidence and conviction in those moments to make those decisions, it all starts to, the light kind of turns on. But I saw him, you know, I saw him beat a blitz and hit Marquise Goodwin on a quick slant. You know what I mean? I saw him take the time and throw bullets down to Darnell Mooney. I even thought, like, you know, the, the interception went through Darnell Mooney's hands. We kind of, He kind of gave him a chance there. Yeah. And the best part about it was even whether he's on the run or he's in the pocket right now, he has been a touch high at times on a couple of throws. I just think he's been really accurate. I mean, that's the other part that's really been impressive for me because I think that's one of the things that maybe yeah. the previous quarterback probably got knocked for a little bit. The easy throws got a little too hard. The more uh, advanced throws he couldn't really complete. So far, Justin Fields – is has been accurate in that and now it's just a matter of kind of putting all those pieces together i think if you can start with accuracy from the quarterback position i think you got yourself a a pretty good chance to be pretty good no, I, I couldn't agree with you more and i think that the interception he's at the end of the game he's trying to make a play yeah i, mean, I, I love I can't it fault him in that i mean you know, so so people will say oh whatever but that's the situation where you got to make a play honestly if the defense would perform better he would have more chances in that second half to to, to really make some hay out there offensively and and I think, you know, let, let, let's shift to the defense real quick, if, if I may. And, you know, guy I've been really high on all season, Robert Quinn, right? And he's going against Trent Williams, in my opinion, is one of the best left tackles in the game. Mm -hmm. And Robert Quinn was on the ground a lot on that. And I'm not talking about just losing his feet. I'm talking about Trent Williams, you know, was was using his momentum against him, throwing him to the ground, you know, because he's, he's a smart guy, Trent Williams, right? He knows – the thing is, he reminds me a lot of a of a younger Jason Peters, right? They have similar builds, hmm. you know. They're, they're both around six four, you know, probably about three thirty five. Very athletic, very strong. You know, they're not the six seven types, you know. You see, very athletic and strong. And Jason Peters, you know, uh, Trent Williams. What they do is that you know, if they see a guy is leaning too much, right? 
what they're going to do is just club you right on the right on right on your hand, right on the back of your your shoulder pad. And you're going to fall, and he's going to fall right on top of you. Right, job done. That's what that's what he was doing majority of the game. And then Robert Quinn, you know what we've seen from him in, in prior games is hey, you know he, he's known as a speed guy. You know, using that dip and rip. Um, but at times he's used power and trying to power a guy like Trent Williams. Good luck with that. We 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 didn't see him come home with that. So that that's that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying Robert Quinn is, is not having a great season by any means, but I think you know when, when it comes against some talented pass rushers, he, you, you have to change the way the way you rush. And and you saw you know he had, he had one one really good rush towards the end of the game where uh, I think it was did he did he, he almost broke. pick off that pass to Debo Samuel? Did you yeah. know that he got uh, really yeah, he almost he did was, he smelled it out exactly. and he almost did it. Yeah, yeah. So he's been playing great with effort, but I thought. In my opinion, that was one of his worst pass rushing games. You know, I, he really was not a factor out there. And uh, I think that's hats off to Trent Williams. You know, you're going to go against really good left tackles in this game. I think he's one of the better ones because what's really hard, you know, usually left tackles, th this is this is their, their kind of vibe. They're athletic guys that, you know, maybe aren't the best run blockers, but they're very good feet. They can stay in front of a guy. Um, you know, they, they stay away, uh, they stay in front of a, a very fast athletic pass rusher, right? But they sometimes struggle against power, you know, that's that's kind of their but a guy like Trent Williams, a guy like Jason Peters, you don't see them get bowled over very much at all, you know, because they have great feet and they're su super strong, they can run block, they can do it all. So that's that's what you see, like, majority of the left tackles in the league aren't as stout as a guy like Trent Williams, you know, it just doesn't happen, you know. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a money, it's a money versus money matchup there. And sometimes exactly. their money wins, you know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. But that's in a situation where from Robert Quinn and your one-on-one -on -one rushes aren't working, right? What am I going to do? I'm going to set up a game kind of like the 49ers did, you know, how they got Jason Peters and Cody white here on different levels. Remember I talked about the exit game, right? So why that worked for San Francisco was that they got them on different levels, right? The defensive end came inside on Jason Peters. He wasn't able to stone him at the line and take him off his, off his spot. He was able to get penetration and pick Cody Whitehair and get in through there. So that's what opened it up. And that's what Robert Quinn should do. He said, hey, like, straight rush is not working. Let's run a Texas game. Let's run an exit. Let's run something else. Let's keep them off balance because the straight rush wasn't working. And I think in a situation, you know, some some games you're just not pass rushing well right you have to do it either through blitzes through games and we didn't see enough of any of those you know it just seemed like it was a lot of straight rush and you know whenever your situation you know where it's just not coming home you, you have to go to that you know you can't just rely on the straight rush if it's not working because Jimmy Garoppolo had too much time I mean it's simple as that there's a couple of times where you're like oh my gosh he's eating a sandwich back there you know he's, he's eating Jimmy John's like Jimmy John's getting delivered you know, he's having chips. He's having a soda, a cookie. Like, come on. You can't have all day like that. The cookie, too? He had that yeah, much time? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, you cannot give somebody that much time. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's a little on Sean Desai, you know, uh, trying to dial it up. Have have different opportunities where you can come home. Um, because that's that's been the, that's been the biggest knock on the team is, is their inability to stop the run, which we saw again, um, you know, gashing run plays. That's just like – you're not going to win games if, if you can't if you can't stop the run. And how do you expect to pass rush, you know, well, if you cannot stop the run? You have to make teams one-dimensional. I mean, it, it really is. You have to confuse teams, blitzes. You have, you have to be able to stop the run, keep them off balance, and then you can pin your ears back and, and, and really get after them. Yeah, the Chicago Bears are now along 5.6 yards per rush, Corey. Um, I, yeah, that's not, not good. good. That's Emmett. That's Barry Sanders territory. Okay. And yeah, that's Hall of Fame. That's yeah, all there of aren't fame. a lot of Barry Sanders running around the NFL. Um, if it's cool, Corey, we'll get to our final topic and maybe you will allow me to pull something out of a, pull a hot take out of the oven that I've had for a while. And okay. You can, your, you can stick your needle temperature needle in there and tell me how hot it is. Tell me how wrong I is. Yeah. But let me set it up to you like this in the post game yesterday, Akeem Hicks, who doesn't talk to the media very often, but when he does, he's amazing. I love hearing his thoughts and opinions. Um, about football and about the game and about the Chicago Bears. When they asked him about, you know, this is, you know, the third game in a row right now where I think we've had a lot of criticisms about the Chicago Bears defense. We were leading the league in sacks. We're kind of sort of dropping down that list as the weeks go on a little bit. And he characterized it as it's the ebbs and flows of a season. You know, sometimes you're going to get locked in. Sometimes you're going to have a couple of rough stretches here. 
in your opinion right now, where in general, broadly, moving forward, the next nine games of this season, where is this defense, in your opinion, trending right now? It's been a tough schedule. We all knew that coming in. Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, and then, you know, yesterday they just didn't play very well. Mm -hmm. Is this an ebb and flow phase for you? Is this maybe a slippery slope, a concern for a little bit more? Where is this defense trending for you right now? And then I'm going to bring you my, my big my big hot take. Yeah, I, I think this is a slippery slope. I think it's trending down. Um, I, I don't I don't think it's the ebbs and flows because what we've seen in the prior years, like the first season when Nagy came in, right? We saw some performances where it wasn't there, but the key was they had that bend but don't break philosophy, right? Which you see from the really good defense, right? You're not going to have your A game every game. But what you see is when it's time to hold the team to a field goal, you hold them to a field goal. You don't let them get in the end zone. And that's been the biggest difference from this Bears team is lack of turnovers. And, you know, in situations where they're not performing well, the bend but don't break philosophy where you're allowing, you know, field goals as opposed to touchdowns. And, you know, the, the, the key is, you know, I'm, I look at, you know, the Browns game. That was a tough one. They bounced back the game after that. And then, the four, the uh, Buccaneers game, I mean, that was just very disappointing. I mean, that was like we were down from the first possession, and you knew. Like I, I looked at I looked at my co-host for Fox, and I said, "This is gonna be a long game." <laughs> I can just tell. I can just tell by just the energy. The, you know, you can kind of just tell. You know, which which team is is look is looking like they're gonna wobbly right just away. Seemed, first yeah, they just seemed out of it. Um, and and I I definitely am concerned. I I don't think this is a dominant defense by any means at this point. Yeah, they, they started out pretty decent um, as far as sack numbers, but turnovers haven't been there. Um, you know, red zone defense has struggled at times. Um, and especially the past couple of weeks, that's what's really concerning. Um, and especially against San Francisco, even being without Khalil Mack, you had Akeem Hicks back and you thought it's a situation where, hey, we could dial up some stuff. We could be able to get home, um, you know, together and, and, you just didn't see that. So I'm, I'm very concerned because that's always been the backbone of this team for how, however long the Bears have been around. You run the football well, you play good defense, um, and we just haven't seen. And I think the, the, the hardest part is not the lack of pressure, it's just not being able to stop the run game. I think that's the most disheartening point, part for me because I think when you stop the run, the rush works together with that, right? Your pass rush. Because when you make a team one dimensional, right, you're able to get more sacks, right? Because then you have some more coverage sacks, you can dial up blitzes, you know, you can really pin your ears back and get home. So I think that works hand in hand. I think that's the biggest reason why we're seeing the drop off in the sack numbers and not being able to get the turnovers is our inability to stop the run. Because in the prior years when they had Vic Fangio, they stopped the run very well. And, and what that does is that puts a lot of pressure on opposing quarterbacks, right? And then the, then the game caller, the offensive coordinator, he, he has to, you know, d devise this great plan, you know, how I'm going to get the ball down the field. And then you have Khalil Mack and company breathing down your neck. And then you have a blitz coming from Vic Fangio. He's dialing it up. And then everything gets all out of accords. And, and you know, that, that offense is off balance at that point. So that's we're – just, we're just not seeing them keep people off balance. And it starts with stopping the run. I think if they can stop the run – that would make this defense a lot more dominant. Yeah, I also noticed maybe to my layman's eyes, and I could be wrong, San Francisco did a better job of, hey, we got to get a hat on Roquan Smith. If we can block him or get him kind of obstructed from the view, we got running lanes all over the place. So here's where I'm going where I'm going with this defense. Hot take. I, and look, man, I, I, I agree with you on this, but it kind of struck me yesterday of, look, I don't want to say the rest of the season that the defense can't play well because they can. We still have guys on this team that I think – Khalil Mack, uh, Robert Quinn, Jalen Johnson, Roquan Smith, and for you know Bears fans, whether you like him or not, Eddie Jackson, these are guys that you're going to be moving forward with no matter what. Maybe you bring back a Bilal Nichols and you bring some of the rookies back like Gibson. But the funny thing is a lot of people yesterday were watching this game and saying to themselves, man, if the offense looks better without Matt Nagy, we should just fire Matt Nagy. And I will tell you that the defensive performance yesterday I think did more damage – to Matt Nagy probably eventually being fired and or Ryan Pace than the offense because and, and here's what I'm saying Corey and look I'm a Bears fan so I I think of I think of the name on the front and not on the back so I'm sorry here on this one but I'm thinking of the next four years right mm -hmm. next year you want to fight for a playoff spot the year after 
you want to be contending for a Super Bowl in the fourth year. Maybe you want to win that Super Bowl. This is how I'm thinking as a Bears fan. So we got four years now to make this happen. I am seeing an insane overhaul in this defense coming. I mean, I'm talking turnover. I'm sorry, Akeem Hicks, Danny Trevathan, some other pieces, maybe Kendall Vodor because he's getting a ton of reps right now. Some of those guys can mature and become starters moving forward. But I'm almost seeing more work needs to be done defensively than there does need to be offensively. And because of that, I think this puts Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace's job probably in more jeopardy because of the amount of work that they need to do. And the question is, are we really going to let these guys rebuild this defense yeah. the way that it is? So here's my hot take. If the Bears, the McCaskey family, if they're serious about winning the Super Bowl, next year's coach of the Chicago Bears should be Sean Payton. And here's why. Look, he's under contract till 2025, right? You're going to have to write a blank check. But personally, I like my blank checks. I like my overpays not on the salary cap. And mm -hmm. I prefer to probably head them to the head coach. Oh. And, here's the, and here's the other deal, right? You can even get away with kicking Ryan. And this is a rumor that's been out there that Ryan Pace goes up to president of football operations. Mm -hmm. You bring in Sean Payton. And together you find whatever general manager you want to give him a possible chance. But Sean Payton has a heavy, heavy, heavy influence on this. You pay him $13, $14 million a year. I'm not even joking. It's like a John Gruden. This is how you get out of it. And you somehow <laughs> rationalize that, hey, Mickey Loomis, you can go out and finally find your own coach in New Orleans. Jameis Winston's got a torn ACL. You're telling me Sean Payton has a better shot to win a Super Bowl in New Orleans than he does with Justin Fields in Chicago. And if we're serious about this, Andy Reid and Pat Mahomes, this is that next version. Sean Payton should come to Chicago and work with Justin Fields, and we turn this whole puppy over, right? And we spend a ton of money, and I'm saying you don't even need to spend a ton on the offense because I think Sean Payton can help make up for it. Yeah. you got to rebuild this defense. you got to do the whole thing. You maybe even can keep pace if you bring in Sean Payton. What say you? I, I, I like I like that take, honestly. Uh, I just don't ever see him leaving New Orleans. I think uh, – I, I hear you. That's what's so hot yeah, about it because no yeah. one is talking about it. But yeah. I'm telling you – what is it? What what the the USC Mike Tomlin thing? Like blank check, man. Sean Payton, yeah. come home. This is a challenge. You've got a quarterback. You're telling me you're going to find a quarterback as talented as Justin Fields that's going to get you another 10 years in your career in New Orleans? Yeah. Unless you want to pay three first yeah. rounders for Russell Wilson? Yeah, no, no. I I, uh, I I like that. I like that a lot. I think Sean Payton, um, his track record and, and, you know, just having success with uh, – he coached Romo as well, right? I believe when he was in he Dallas, did. right before, yeah, yeah. So when he he, he kind of helped Romo out in his career, and and look at Tony Romo had a pretty dang good career uh, himself. Uh, and then look what he did with Drew Brees. You know, he really, really elevated his career. I mean, he took him. And, then, and look what he does when he doesn't have Drew Brees, like Trevor yeah. Simeon yesterday. He's done it yep. with Jason Hill. He's done it with other guys yeah. in different ways. Yeah. He win in different ways. He likes oh, running man. the ball. I, I'm just saying. I would, I would love that, honestly, I, because I think that's what we've kind of missed. And, and I think everybody thought Matt Nagy was going to be that kind of Andy Reid, um, you know, Sean McVay, uh, Sean Payton type that's a quarterback guru that, hey, whoever, you know, he's with, he can elevate his game. You know, I think, I think that's, that's really what got him hired in Chicago was kind of almost like a false pre pretense in, in my opinion, because everybody, I said this, everyone thought he was the coordinator calling the plays, but he wasn't, it was Andy Richo, right? And definitely had influence in Alex Smith, maybe, uh, you know, maybe some of his decision-making, breaking down film with them. I'm not knocking that at all, but as a, as a game caller, he, he doesn't, doesn't have much experience. And I think it shows, right? Because, what we see is progression. We see things get better and it just progressively got worse. Yeah. I think, I think his first year was probably the best in my, in my opinion, you know, um, it, it wasn't crazy stats, but we were able to move the ball. And then it got to a point where, you know, Mitch's last year, it was like, wow, this is, this is bad. And even the end of 2018 wasn't yeah. that great. It was like the first eight or nine weeks that our offense really looked good yeah. and inventive and yeah. creative. And I'm telling yeah. you, if our defense is going to take a step backwards and take a step forwards, Matt Nagy can't be doing the offense. I'm telling, yeah. just telling you that right now. And look, we probably Khalil Max got two years left on his deal, right? You know, we got Eddie for Eddie Jackson for a while. We got Robert Quinn for probably I think two or three more years. I mean, even those guys are going to have to move on in this Justin Fields era. Yeah. I'm just starting to look down the road right now. The road needs to start immediately, and we need to pair him with one of the best offensive minds in the NFL. 
do you, do you think do you think you could potentially see a college name, a big college name that's uh, kind of kind of almost like a Cliff Kingsbury type, a guy that's really innovative offensive schemes and known for working with mobile quarterbacks? Could you see anything like that potentially? See, I I would be very personally, I'd be very interested in that. And don't get me wrong, I'm interested in like an Eric Bieniemy. Like I I think that's yeah. an actual coordinator who probably deserves more of a shot than Matt Nagy did. But the other thing I'll say is if you look at the history of the Chicago Bears is they they do the opposite all the time, right? They 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 flip-flop between uh experience or no experience, right? I mean, they've only brought in John Fox is the only one that's had previous head coaching experience before, but if mm-hmm. you watch like they did Lovey Smith defense, they went to Mark Trestman offense. They went to John Fox defense, they went to Matt Nagy offense. So I would be like, "Well, what do we do now? Are we interviewing what Todd Bowles next year for yeah. you know head coaching role? Give him another shot at it." I think a college yeah. coach would actually be a really interesting move because I think it could bring a lot of different ideas. And we do need someone. I think Matt Nagy has done a decent job of keeping the locker room together as a whole, but he never mm-hmm. really brought results to the field. We need a little bit of both of that. Yeah. I'm just also sort of thinking you got to just take a big swing at some point. And if you if you're serious and you don't want to mess around, you got to be real. And those college coasters, what like Dabo Sweeney, right? Something like that, yeah. big time. No, no, nothing, nothing. Even like, hey, let's give him a shot or an up and coming. I think we need something a little bit more established coming in the door. So, so what about a guy? This could be a potential hot take. What about Ryan Day, his old college oh. coach? I I like that. You I know, like- he's he's a very good offensive mind. He's had great success with him. Um, you know, and I, I think he has what it takes as, as a play caller. I mean, he was he was the coordinator before, you know, under Urban Meyer. Um, really, really, some quarterbacks really flourishing. You know, Dwayne Haskins, uh, Justin Fields. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think he has he has the kind of persona that he's not too much. Where I think NFL people will respect it. You know, it's not too much of that you know, piss and vinegar, you know, uh, yeah. people always say he's a very mild mannered coach. And I think that's kind of what you need. So I could potentially see in something like that, maybe, you know, um, that's a I great think- call Mo- modern, modern energy. I will say one caveat real quick to that is, uh, Ryan Pace cannot be the general manager for that decision. No. I think that's a new guy no. making him make picking Ryan O'Day. It, exactly. Exactly. But I, I think, you know, when you talk about, I look at Ohio state, like they're in my opinion, they run things like an NFL type team. You know, they, they're they're at a different level than other universities out there. It is a football factory and, you know, they, they go to school, they do whatever. But if you go to Ohio State, you know, you go there to make the NFL. You don't go there, you know, like what's his name? Uh, Cardell Jones, he said, he said, we didn't we didn't go to play school. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's 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 the reality in, in certain things. You know, a, a school like that, Ohio State. They are a football factory just from the way they run their practices, their training table, your film study. It is a different beast. And I, I think that would be that could potentially be a good transition, you know, for a guy like Ryan Day, uh, Justin Fields. He feels comfortable with him. And Justin Fields is the guy of the Bears future. I don't I don't care what you what you want to say about it. I I feel confident in that. I, I love that call, man, because that's right. Uh, that's right next to my hot take kitchen. You know what I mean? I, we need someone that's established, right? And I think the Kyler Murray, Cliff Kingsbury thing, which you already brought up, I think we can call that a success, right? I'm not. Yeah. I don't know if they're going to win the Super Bowl this year, but there's a seamlessness to Cl- Kingsbury. Understands Kyler, yep. knows how to put him in a position to succeed, and Kyler trusts what's being called, and they can collaborate. And now, yeah. what they're seven and zero, or, or whatever their record is right now, exactly. You know, they're, they're trending up. That's where the Chicago Bears want to be. And that's what I'm saying, but I, I think it's that level of stuff, man. I, As much as I want to say, let's give the next hot young assistant who's put in his dues and his time and give him his shot at his own, you know, running his own show, I like yeah. that mentality. I really do. I think it fits in a lot of different organizations. I think timing-wise and what the Bears are going to be looking for in the next four years with the overhaul in defense, a brand-new quarterback – and hopefully an offensive line that is going to be able to grow with him the next four or five years and two running backs that are probably going to be with him for the next three, which is yeah. great news. And Darnell Mooney for the yeah. next three. We need someone established that can hit the ground running and not this whole like I'm learning as I go, figuring it out. No. Someone that comes in right away, commands the room and just we can just take it and just go and, and let's yeah. go. Yeah, I, I like your thing about Sean Payton. I just 
I know it's a hot take. I just don't. I could. I can't see him leaving. But I, I would know. love for. I love for him to. I'm not saying hey, money it's... talks. <laughs> yeah. money, money talks though, right? Hey, he would say, no, no, I'm loyal to Mickey Loomis and all these. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, 14 million. Oh, okay, yeah, honey, we'll move to Chicago, okay. Um, yeah, and, and that's look, what it becomes. And I'm with you, man. Everything out there says that it's not going to happen, which makes it so dang hot. But the thing yeah. was. Two years ago, he signed a five-year contract extension in 2019, making him the most, the highest paid coach in the NFL. And it was Drew Brees' last year. And the whole thing about it was like, we're really looking forward to bringing Sean back to, you know, usher one last year of Drew Brees and just, you know, be the steward of the Saints moving forward. And honestly, look what's happened this year, right? You know, Jameis is out with a torn ACL. Offensively, what do they honestly have? They don't have, it's not Michael Thomas. They have Alvin Kamara and that's it. Let's be, you know, running backs have shelf life, not to be mean about it. If you're looking at the landscape, Sean Payton, I would say come to Chicago, make the most money you've ever made, yeah. uh, get a restaurant named after okay. you, uh, you know, and then, and then, and then defensively go out and start just draft a ton of Corey Wootens, man, draft a ton of young, <laughs> young Corey Wootens, man. And let's just start building this thing back up because I think the defense might need more work than the offense in the off season. No, nah, I agree with you. I I, I I like the Ryan Day thing because of Cliff Kingsbury, right? When he first got there, you know, it was okay. The first two years with uh, Kyler Murray. And then this year, you really see everything come together, right? And you, you see what everybody was looking for. So I kind of, I, I kind of, I kind of think a more realistic version is Ryan Day. I, 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 I like that a lot. And I think oh, way more realistic for sure. And I, think, for sure. And I think the fact that he has that track record with Justin Fields and the fact that the bears are like, this is our franchise guy and who knows how to get the best out of him, game plan scheme wise. And you're like, Hmm, okay. Ryan day. Right. And, and it, and it just fits because listen, a lot of, how a how a guy progresses in this league is based on who their coach is, right? Putting them in positions to succeed, right? And I think I, I've said this many times. That's why the Patriots have have always been successful as long as Bill Bel- Belichick has been there. You know, I think you know some other teams like Green Bay. Uh, you know, the past since since from before time. You know, yeah. Brett Favre, etc. Making they, fire they, for the first they, time. They, they, they develop talent very well, right? Their, their GM, you know, their, their decision makers have, have put together the, the right po- uh, pieces to the puzzle. And then they've had great staffs to develop that talent and put everything together. So that's, that's what we need. You know, we need a better decision maker at the GM position. We need, we need a better head coach, in my opinion. Um, you know, I think we have the talent there. I think this has been the most talent I think we've seen on, on offense in a while. Um, and I think we just need to, to be productive. And I, and I think, Hey, things are going to continue to get better with Justin Fields, right? As long as they can scheme up and game plan for him, we've seen progression. I think that last game against, against the 49ers showed us that, but I think going forward, right. Um, you know, the rest of the season, because I, I honestly don't think Matt Nagy will be there next season I, I think he's i think he's gone i don't think they're gonna fire him during the season because that's not how the bears roll real quick uh, what happened what happens to pace do you do you believe that rumor that they kick yeah. him upstairs the president of football ops or do you think he gets fired too in my opinion if you didn't think he was good enough to be the general manager i don't know why you why keep promote him, him? exactly, yeah, why, why exactly. Promote him? <laughs> you know i can understand a situation where he was doing such a great job but he's like hey i want to move up you know if the bears are rocking and rolling and this that and the other and his choice to do that but in a situation where you don't feel confident in him making decisions about players, et cetera, coaches, why would you keep him? You know, it just doesn't make sense. So that, that would kind of baffle me. But um, yeah, I think, I think, I think after the season, um, unless they have some crazy turnaround, you know, where they just go on a streak and start winning games and everything is rolling. I don't think, uh, you know, Matt Nagy or Pace will be there, but Hey, I would like to be gladly surprised. Yeah. But, so, so I guess, I guess we'll see how it develops, but I just don't see the bears um, going on the kind of run that, you know, I think we're all hoping for. Yeah, no, look, I, I think we're just trying to be, I think we're just trying to be fair to the realistic or what's real moving forward. I mean, I think if they lose to the Steelers next week, going on a bye week you can definitely probably let him go and relieve him of your duties and you just get a head start and start week nine and just see what, you know, what you can put together with the team and, you know, whatever, let Chris Tabor do it. Um, exactly. I, I don't think that we're trying to do that, but honestly, it's not trending in the right direction. Players aren't getting any younger. 
Um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. That is obvious. And these guys have had four years to try and fix the ship. So if there's more work that needs to be done, you do have to ask yourself, it is a bit of a crossroads. Exactly. Whenever you're trending downward and not upward, it's not a good sign. They're not even going sideways at this point. Since Matt Nagy has got there, everything's been going downhill since that first season. So I think that's telling you everything you need to know. Um, I think he set the bar high at that point, what happened in that first season. Uh, guys bought into him. I thought they really believed in him. They, they, they loved playing for him. And then what happens is when you start losing games, people are like, okay, I don't know if I buy in as much. And, and I think that's what you're seeing. Yeah, and he lost six games in a row last year. And I was asking the questions on this pod, you know, after four or five, you know, how many is too much? And yeah. now we're at three. If they lose next week, that's four, four yeah. in a row. What it, It's one point, it just is yeah. too much in the long run. I, I think the biggest thing why I don't think he has the locker room right now is because I think people are realizing, listen, you know, some of the guys have been there throughout his whole tenure. They're thinking, well, you know, I've been here with him since day one, right? The offense has progressively gotten worse, right? And he's always been questioned that after and in, in post games, um, you know, in the off season. And he said that he thinks he's doing a good job or he has to look at what he's doing and improve on, you know? And I, I think people respect if, if he just said, hey, listen, you know, I looked in the mirror and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not a good enough play caller and I'm doing you guys a disservice. You know, um, if he had a meeting with the guys and say, listen, you know, that's my fault. I let my ego get in the way and we're all men. And I, I did. And I apologize for that. You know, I want to give you guys the best chance to win games. I'm your head coach. I love you guys. You know, I love, you know, going into games with you guys. So I'm going to relieve my play calling duties, Bill Laser. you know, you call the plays. I feel confident in him. I'm going to let him do his thing. And, hey, I love you guys. Let's do this. I think if he would have said that, it would have set the tone in the locker room and it would have been a different story. But what happens is when, when, when you let your ego get in the way and you constantly deflect and say, ah, I think we're doing a pretty good job. And I think, you know, I could maybe do this a little bit. You're beating around the bush. People don't respect that, you know, and, and people don't stand behind that. So I think that's why you're seeing – the progression going downwards. Cause I think at first people were like, Oh, I love this guy. Nagy. you know, everything's that much better. Our defense is rocking. You know, we don't even need the offense to do anything. You know, we're just, we're just there, but Hey, our defense is rocking. We're getting turnovers. We're scoring points. Everything's fun. Everything's great. Launches the midway. But then when the defense isn't the same, right. It puts the pressure on everybody and guys just, just get frustrated. Cause they're like, why, why wouldn't he just say, you know, Hey, I'm relieving myself like man up. Right. Because at the end of the day, this ship goes down with you, Matt Nagy, as, as the coach, right? And everything is, is on you. So if you're not doing a good enough job, let a coordinator call it, right? Because not everybody can call the plays. But sometimes in this league, players, coaches, they let the egos get in the way. I, mean, I, I, I want to go out my way and I want to do this. Mm -hmm. But you know what going out your way goes? Doesn't get you another head coaching job. No, oh, no, no, no. You know what I mean? Listen so to college. The, this is a college job. Exactly, exactly. So, and and even as a coordinator, I don't think anybody's going to take him as a coordinator because that's a situation where you're like, look at your track record, right? I love what you did, and and uh, you know, if the enemy gets hired, I could see him going back and working on the Kansas City Chiefs staff as a maybe a quarterback's quality control yeah. consultant, whatever name you want to, you know, cook exactly. up. Exactly. Yeah. But, but at the, at the end of the day, uh, you know, my, my college quarterback, Mike Kafka, he's now the, the uh, QB coach and uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes has said some good stuff about him. So that's the thing where I, I yeah, I, I don't know. I, at this, at this situation, I just think he's made things very hard for him at this point, you know, Q QB coach, I, I think at, at this point, any, any potential coach has been in the league around people can be a QB coach, but I don't think that's what his goal is. I think his goal was coach, head coach and coordinator. And at this, at this time, it just, it makes everything that much harder to get a job in the league. Final note. Uh, I loved watching me some Kafka, by the way. Yeah. Like the day. Piece, man. yeah. I mean, some yeah. people are Steve Schnurr side. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of liked Kafka. He would put up some big games, man. Oh I, yeah. I, Especially I his last it. year. I mean, yes. think about it. He, um, first, first four years, you know, it was on and off playing, didn't play much. C.J. Bechet was the guy. And then uh, his last year, um, you know, he started working with Brett Bazinet. I don't know if you remember Brett Bazinet, um, QB, that was there my rookie year. He was there from like 01 to 05. He, got, he played for the Bears in Carolina. 
Um, but he was he was Northwestern's like all time leading uh, passer before Clayton Thorson. Um, but he was absolute absolute beast, like one of the most intelligent guys. Mike Kafka worked with him in the off season before our fifth year. And Mike was a guy that like everyone, you know, he, he really didn't put up numbers. He wasn't, didn't make the best decisions, but that last year he like really guy. came in his own. Yeah, oh, he balled out. He's all big 10, got himself drafted in the fourth round. And I think <laughs> the difference was that he worked with, with, a, with a guy like Brett Bassett that kind of schooled him on how to read defenses, how to make decisions, how, how to do things like that. And I, I think that's so integral for, for a young quarterback and especially like with Justin Fields in Chicago, that's that's why I would love to see a, a great offensive mind and mentor to, to be with him for the next, you know, 10 years um, and, and have that relationship with a Sean Payton, a guy like Ryan Day, something like that in, in the future. So I would love to see something like that, because I think that's the X factor when it comes to developing and molding a young quarterback. Well, I will, I will say I think the, the the reality is probably a little bit closer to your idea than probably my idea, but I think we both want the same thing. You I can think. all dream big, Joey. <laughs> I mean, hey, when you walk into the hot kitchen with the hot takes coming out of the oven all the time, you gotta you gotta watch out. Your eyebrows will get singed a little bit. So you know, yeah, I'm here to exactly. Dream. As long as you have your costume uh, mask on, you won't get anything singed. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's very true. The Michael Myers here. I can see it on fire right now. Yeah. Uh, believe in Bears, man. That'll do it. Uh, Bears 49ers week eight wrap up. Bears lose. We both picked the Bears to win, so we're taking another loss on our season picks, but we get another opportunity later this week uh, as we preview Bears Steelers. Big, uh, big game coming up. I mean, it's kitchen sink time for the Chicago Bears, right? As they head into their bye week, if they don't pick up this game, we could probably close the book on anything regarding playoffs, and we might see some major changes coming down the down the down the pike, Corey. Exactly. So this this is a must win game. Last week is must win. Every game from here on out is, is a must win. They have to go on a run here, and it starts with Pittsburgh. So hopefully they get things running all all cylinders. Pittsburgh, in my opinion, is a very beatable team. Um, you know, we're going to dive into to all the matchup and keys to this game, but I think this is a very winnable game. You know, I think Pittsburgh has been struggling. Ben roethlisberger has been struggling so uh later on in the week we're going to dive into it so uh lo love uh doing this with you joey um love love you guys support um you can follow me at at cory wooten c-o-r-e-y-w-2-o's two t's o-n twitter and instagram and like i said we're gonna we're gonna have all the keys uh coming up on wednesday um for you for the steelers game and and looking forward to it yeah, man. Great pod, Corey. Uh, Joey Sports Guy, Instagram and Twitter if you want to give me a follow. Thank you so much for checking out this pod. Remember, Bears fans, Justin Fields took a huge step forward. And we also have the Vikings twice, the Lions, the Giants, and the Steelers matchup coming up. That's four wins right there that I feel pretty good about. And then you got to steal a couple the rest of the way. So keep, keep the head up. Keep walking the straight line. We'll see what happens. Be well, be safe. Please be good to each other. Like and subscribe this pod. We will be back in just a couple of days. But until then, remember, bear down. Bear down, baby. Kafka. Yeah. <laughs>